All right, so into specific ocular pharmacology, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how this kind of differs in it is so far as how we administer these medications, how um, the kinetics change a little bit when you're dealing with ocularly administered drugs versus something that would say be given orally or IV. Um, and so we'll see some of the kind of the unique uh, aspects of that. So anyway, um, as far as administration of ocular meds go, how do we most often give them? Yeah, eye drops. So typically you're applying eye drops uh, directly to the surface of the eye, kind of like a topical sort of uh, administration. There's other ways you can do that. I don't know if anyone has any kind of like needle phobias with the eyes. I think it's pretty creepy, but um, there's several different ways that you can uh, administer medications that would be a little bit more uh, invasive. So you can have things like here, where you're doing a subconjunctival uh, injection, retrobulbar, peribulbar. Um, there's different places you can apply these medications depending on the indication. Um, so for instance, we see this a lot with uh, our ophthalmologists over at Nemours and they're doing surgery they'll do a lot of these type of injections um, specific. So again, it's not something you guys are going to do on a routine basis unless you're working uh, in ophthalmology specifically. So you guys are going to be mostly focused on kind of that topical administration. And that's what I'm going to focus on here, uh, most likely. So um, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the different routes you could administer, um, the, the topical or is really the big thing that we're going to be focusing on here for our purposes. Um, you know, note that the onset of action is usually going to be pretty quick for this stuff. As soon as you administer it, it should start to, to kind of work there. Um, it's also kind of the most convenient, the cheapest out of the, out of the bunch for sure, and then also relatively safe. Um, the big thing you have to watch out for, though, is going to be things like compliance. Like, is the medication being given appropriately? Is the patient using it right? Um, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, if you're not using it correctly, you can end up um, not getting any medication delivered to the eye or the patient's not going to be compliant. So we'll look at education points and how to make sure they can use those meds effectively. The other big thing is looking for these systemic side effects from nasal or lacrimal absorption. So that's one of the kind of key things we'll talk about is that, you know, normally with like, say, an otic administered medication, you don't really see any systemic absorption, right? But when you have something like the nasal lacrimal duct and some of those meds will get absorbed through that, um, you'll end up seeing uh, systemic effects. So for instance, if I give something like a, a med that will block beta receptors, specifically beta one, what do you think effects you might see from that? decreased heart rate, right? So if I block beta receptors, you see a decreased heart rate. So we'll get some beta blockers in the eyes for glaucoma. We talk about that later, but you can actually see that causing uh, bradycardia and possibly some hypotension for uh, some patients. And all that has to do with not it being absorbed from the eye necessary, but that drainage uh, where eventually it'll hit these kind of highly vascular membranes and it gets absorbed, right? And keep in mind, this also bypasses that first pass effect. You guys remember that? What is the first pass? It's that liver tax we're paying there. So that avoids that because, again, we're, we're getting absorbed directly from that, that mucosa there. So anyways, we'll talk more about that as we go on. I just realized there's going to be some other, um, uh, other means to, to administer medications, but that's not what we're going to focus on specifically here. Uh, there's also some other kind of interesting things. Sometimes you can even have um, some like uh, implants or inserts that can be applied. So this is an example of a ganciclovir um, uh, implant that you can actually put into the eye and you'd use this for something like CMV retinitis. And so we'll talk briefly about that a little bit later on. But there's, you know, there's different routes. There are different um, kind of specialty kind of products you can use. But the, for the most part, we're going to be using these suspensions or solutions um, uh, depending on the, the formulation of the drug. Do you have any other kind of topical um, sort of formulations you can use for ocular meds? Is there something called sugar bath? Is there something topical? Yeah, just, just like administer directly to the eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can have ointments, right? So you can have thicker formulations. You have gels and ointments that can be applied. We'll talk about how that differs a little bit. And you might, uh, for some patients, you may choose like, hey, you know, an ointment might be better for this type of patient versus a solution. Um, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. So just know there's different formulations out there. Um, the dosing is a little bit different when you're dealing with more kind of uh, more viscous or solid kind of uh, dosage forms. And so we'll look at that later. The thing here to note is that uh, depending on the dosage form, the longer it's in contact with the eye, the better it's going to be working or the longer it's going to be working for essentially. And so that means that we have more time in that cul-de-sac. And what's the cul-de-sac besides where you might live? <laughs> Well, yeah, so it affects the amount of absorption. But what is that? When I say cul de sac, and I'm referring to the eye, what am I talking about? Kind of basically when you pull the eye down, kind of that space between uh, the eye and kind of the conjunctiva there, um, you know, you'll you'll see that's basically kind of what we're, we're referring to. It's that little space there. Because again, gravity is going to naturally force a lot of those liquids and things to kind of uh, pool there. And so the more contact you have, the, the better you're going to have, uh, the more and more absorption you're going to have. And so that's where our gels, ointments, solid inserts, those are all going to be um, useful for kind of helping to increase that time there.
So looking at kinetics, uh, as far as actual absorption um, goes when you're dealing with actual absorption into the eye, you're going to see that that is going to be uh, dependent on several different factors. Kind of the rate and extent of absorption will depend on uh, that time in the cul-de-sac. So the longer it's there, the better the absorption is going to be uh, kind of a pre-corneal tear film, which I always have a hard time saying. I feel like mumble mouth when I say that, but um, that can also affect uh, absorption potentially. We'll talk about nasolacrimal drainage. So the faster things drain away, the less time it's going to have in the cul-de-sac. So that's going to be important when we talk about actual administration of these meds. Uh, we'll talk about a, a technique we can use to actually prevent that from occurring there. Um, and then also things like you know drug binding, uh, diffusion across the cornea conjunctiva. We'll see here, remember fixed law, we talked about that in pharmacodynamics, kind of was governing how well meds get absorbed across the membrane. This is going to come up again, uh, as we'll see. But really, you can change all of this by changing the drug formulation or by doing things like blocking the, the tear ducts. We can either do this physically. Um, we can sometimes, you'll see for patients who have like chronic dry eye, they'll uh, do things like cauterize uh, those nasal lacrimal ducts to kind of uh, keep the tears around for longer or maybe do like silicone plugs or things like that. Uh, again, so when we have uh, absorption occurring after nasal lacrimal drainage, you're going to be seeing that you can have systemic effects here, and it's bypassing first pass, and that's going to lead to potential side effects. So you can lead to see things like you know cardiovascular instability. You can see thing, changes in in blood glucose and things like that. And so we're going to look at that more in detail when we get to the specific drugs that we talk about. And then as far as transcorneal absorption goes, again, this is necessary for any kind of like local ocular effects that happens here. And there's always going to be a little bit of a lag time. So again, the drug might not be working, depending on, on what you're using it for, it can take time to actually get absorbed and to have its effects there. So just keep that in mind. Um, and again, most of this is going to be dictated by that concentration gradient. Because uh, if you could imagine, what are the other factors that went into fixed law? The thickness of the membrane, what do you think about the, the cornea? Is it pretty thick, pretty thin? Well, relatively thin, right? Because as opposed to like the skin, right? So as opposed to the epidermis, relatively thin. So you have decent absorption there. Uh, what else could affect it? Area. Surface area, right? So we can't really change that very much, right? Because eyes is just as big as eyes going to get. Yeah, so concentration is one thing we can do. So we can change the concentration of the drug product and we can fix that. Um, the other thing to consider is the lipophilicity of the drug. So the more lipophilic it is, the better absorption you have in those uh, situations. So again, some of those things we can change, some of those things we cannot, but that all is going to affect how well the drug gets absorbed you know, across the eye. Again, just another picture to remind you of those, those fun days we had in the summer. Right? Anyhow. Um, as far as distribution goes, you're going to find that typically once uh, these drugs get systemically absorbed, the distribution happens just as normally as it would if you took a, a, a medication orally or give, give an IV, something like that. There's some rare cases where you can actually see drugs actually accumulating within the eye. Uh, it's kind of interesting, this bullseye lesion that you can get with chloroquine. So you see this on fundoscopic exam, see that kind of that drug start to accumulate back there. Um, and so it's just kind of a unique uh, kind of side effect. This is an old school drug we actually don't use uh, very much anymore. But um, as far as metabolism and excretion goes, there's a little bit of metabolism that actually occurs within the eye itself. There's some enzymes there. Um, so this can be useful for some pro drugs we actually give. Remember, pro drugs are inactive in their current state, but have to be uh, enzymatically activated. So this is a good example for a drug like uh, dipavephrine, which gets turned into epinephrine. Which you know has uh, what type of effects in the eye? Hmm? Yeah, you would typically see like dilation of the eye, um, so that can be useful if you need to you know do any kind of exams or you know certain surgeries things like that. Um, and then latanoprost, which is actually gets converted into a prostaglandin, uh, and so this is going to be really important for glaucoma. We'll look at that uh, a little bit later on, but um, the, having those enzymes there can be important for actually activating the drugs and having them uh, actually work. And then once they get absorbed systemically, that's when you're going to see more kind of normal liver and renal elimination. So that really doesn't change much at all. It just depends on how long it takes for the drug to actually get to uh, where they can be um, metabolized or excreted. Okay, so we'll start off by talking a little bit about ocular antimicrobials. I know you guys are all antimicrobial out, but we're going to continue on. This is going to, again, that's why you guys have such a great fundamental now. Uh, something like a 91 average fundamental on antibiotics uh, that we can now apply this to all these other uh, disease states and whatnot. So, um, again, inf an infectious disease of the eye is very common in clinical practice. A lot of people come in complaining of, you know, uh, you know, conjunctivitis, and you'll see that you, know, you can have several kind of varieties of 
periocular infections, you have preceptal, postceptal. Um, and again, depending on how kind of diffuse the disease is, kind of depending on um, the location, it can lead you to choosing um, different types of antibiotics. So for instance, um, you know, looking at, you know, how severe the disease is, looking at things like the age of the patient, how good is their immune system, are they immunocompromised, or how involved the disease is, will lead you to either choosing, say, like a topical medication you can apply directly to the eye, or do we need something that's a little bit more uh, going to be able to treat kind of the surrounding areas, and we may need more systemic therapy. So this in cases where we may need to, depending on the patient, use things like IV therapy or, or PO therapy potentially, even though the infection is kind of right at the side of the eye. Why do you think um, preceding trauma might lead you to choose different antibiotics? Could be one thing. We're also introducing kind of foreign bacteria, right? So especially with those traumas, you had something kind of like, um, uh, you know, exposure. I always think about like, you know, the guys that uh, get in a motorcycle accidents, they get drug across the ground, like they get all kinds of crazy stuff in their wounds because they're just being, uh, you know, anaerobic stuff. You can have fungus and get in there, you know, all kinds of different things with, with these traumas. So again, that will change uh, your antibiotic selection based on what the history of the patient is. So just keep that in mind. So looking at our ocular antimicrobials, obviously the spectrum changes over time. Uh, for instance, things like H flu kind of goes down over time as, as the vaccinations become more prevalent. Um, but again, you may require oral or parental therapies depending on just that involvement and the severity of the disease, how well the patient is able to kind of fight off that infection just with their own host immune system. What we typically find is for, for more small, mild peripheral infections, you can usually get away with topical therapy. And again, I'm saying topical in the sense you're just putting it directly on the eye as opposed to more systemic therapy. Um, the, the benefits of using this uh, is the fact that it's going to limit systemic bioavailability. So you don't have to worry about systemic side effects. Typically, you don't see a lot of these antimicrobials um, achieving very high systemic levels, which is great. Um, you're going to have high local concentrations, right? So that's the other thing is that in a lot of cases, you can overcome resistance of a bacteria just by having a really high concentration. You can achieve higher concentrations than you would if you were to take a tablet or something uh, and kind of overcome that resistance. That's kind of one of the nice things is that you can see that we won't have a ton of resistance that develops to these ocular medications over time, mainly due to the fact that um, they achieve such high concentrations. They kind of wipe about everything. The other problem, though, you're going to see is it needs more frequent dosing because, again, the drug doesn't like to stay there for very long because, again, it's just going to go along with the tears, get, uh, get you know, sent through the nasal lacrimal drainage. Uh, so this does require frequent dosing. So you may see this uh, being given every um, three times a day, four times a day. So, again, compliance is going to be an issue here if the patient has to you know, constantly kind of take a break out of their day to, to administer this stuff. Um, typically, we use pretty broad spectrum antibiotics, as we're going to see, um, and typically you're not going to be culturing these patients. So um, we used a broad enough spectrum of antibiotic that it doesn't really matter what the bacteria is, we're probably going to kill it off. Uh, and so unless you have some kind of uh, compelling reason to get a culture, you really don't need to. So for instance, if you had an immunocompromised patient you're giving them antibiotics and they weren't improving, maybe it's a fungal infection, you know, maybe it's something else. So those would be indications where you may want to get a culture to kind of back you up. So uh, as far as conjunctivitis goes, again, you can find these patients who have this kind of mild hyperemia, very kind of purulent discharge. The most common causes we're going to see with this is going to be viruses, right? So again, um, this will be one of the few instances where it's okay probably to recommend an ocular antibiotic for a viral infection. I'll talk about why that is in a second. Uh, have a lot of allergies, environmental irritants. Contact lenses can be another big thing. Have you covered ophthalmology yet? Yeah. Right. So what, what uh, bug are you worried about with contact lenses? Pseudomonas, absolutely. So that's going to be important when we're dictating what type of antibiotic we're going to use for those patients. So keep that in mind. Less commonly, though, you can certainly see um, you know, immune-mediated reactions, tumors, uh, systemic disease can be cause of this conjunctivitis. But as far as infectious pathogens go, you know, it's a pretty wide range of things. You can have things from strep pneumo to staph aureus to uh, you know, kind of more typical kind of upper respiratory tract kind of gram negatives like H flu, Marxala, cataralis, things like that. Obviously, our goal is to eradicate that infection uh, if one is present and prevent any kind of long-term complications, right? So we want to prevent any kind of long-term damage to the eye over time. So here are the antibiotics we have available to use. Again, you don't have to remember the formulation specifically. Just kind of note here, you know, some of these are solutions. Some of these are going to be ointments. That'll be important when we're kind of deciding which one we want to use. Um, and again, most of the indications are going to be pretty straightforward. So um, you don't have to memorize this whole list. Just know that these are kind of broad spectrum antibiotics we're going to be using uh, to treat all types of conjunctivitis. I'm not going to get really granular on, on the type that we're dealing with. Um, but again, we have things like uh, familiar drugs like azithromycin, things like bacitracin, uh, ciprofloxacin, erythromycin. We've seen a lot of these before already, um, and so we'll see how they get used specifically here for these patients. All right, so again, with our macrolides, how do they work? 
block protein synthesis. Absolutely. So um, again, previously I used to have these slides that's before the antibiotics. So this may go, uh, may seem a little redundant. So I'm probably going to go through these slides pretty quick, um, but just be aware that all that same stuff applies. So again, if we talk about um, for instance, you know, macrolides in this section, uh, it's important to know all those same things that you know about macrolides from the very first lectures we had, right? So, you know, all that stuff is going to come up again. It's important to remember side effects, drug interactions, all <coughs> sorts of things with these drugs. It's not going to apply so much here because we're dealing with uh, topically administered meds, but just be aware that, you know, uh, in the future, if we cover pulmonology, for instance, we talk about pneumonias, we talk about those drugs, all that stuff is going to be fair game, mm -hmm. right? That sounds scarier than it is, trust me, but we'll cover that stuff again. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so again, the, the big thing you're going to note with a lot of these medications is that the, the biggest problem you're going to run into is mainly eye irritation and maybe some hypersensitivity. So again, it's very common side effects with topically administered drugs to the eye. Um, not anything kind of, we'll, we'll note some kind of uh, particular side effects as we go forward, but um, again, most of these have the uh, ability to cause eye irritation. And keep in mind, remember what we said when we were talking about ENT, that you can use ocular meds in other places like the ear, right? Um, but you can't use uh, uh, otic meds in the eye. And why is that? Absorption. Not absorption. It's the formulation, essentially, right? The eye is very sensitive uh, to tonicity, to pH, to uh, all different sorts of things like that. So that's why we need to make sure that we only use ocular meds in the eye because it is very, very sensitive. Because imagine if you ever, like, um, you know, touched a pepper and accidentally rubbed your eye. Like, I, for whatever reason, like, my brain instinctually goes to, hey, I just cut up a jalapeno and my eye itches all of a sudden um, <laughs> every time. And, and so, but, you know, the eye is very, very sensitive to that stuff. Even a very small amount of, of irritant can really, can really hurt the eye. So that's why these uh, formulations have to be made as, as they are. And again, the nice thing here with these topically administered macrolides, we know that macrolides can cause a lot of drug interactions due to CYP-P450 inhibition, right? 3 or 4 specifically, but you don't really see that here because, again, we're measuring them just topically. Systemic absorption is not really a problem with these. The two main ones you're going to see used are going to be erythromycin and azithromycin. Um, note that erythromycin is going to be the much more common one you're probably going to be prescribing. This is kind of a good general all-purpose uh, ocular antibiotic that can be used for most patients. Uh, it usually comes as an ointment uh, you administer. Notice that um, instead of instilling drops, you're going to be writing your prescriptions uh, in inches. So apply half an inch or an inch. And again, it's kind of just uh, the dosing is not quite so um, critical that you need to get, you know, within the millimeter of half an inch, but just roughly half an inch or so, you know, uh, they need to apply. And notice here, very frequent dosing, two to six times a day, depending on the severity of the infection, right? So it can be very difficult for patients to keep up with. You do have something like azithromycin, which is available. This one could be given less frequently because it tends to have a longer half-life or sticks around for longer. Um, but this one tends to be much more expensive. And so I don't see this one used as often unless you have really kind of a compelling indication to use it. Erythromycin is uh, very soothing on the inflamed eye. So again, if it's uh, very dry or if it's just irritated, having like a nice ointment on there can be similar to you know having you know inflamed or dry skin. Putting an ointment on there can be very kind of uh, soothing to that. Same thing applies here. And so this may be one of those things where even if you suspect that your patient's having a viral conjunctivitis, uh, giving them some erythromycin is not really going to be a big deal because it's going to be a comfort to them. Uh, and also, if they ever have like a secondary bacterial infection, that'll still treat it. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is we don't really see resistance develop to, to these ocularly administered meds, so you don't really run into any issues with that. So, you know, if you wanted to do it for someone who you suspect maybe has a viral conjunctivitis, it's probably fine. They're going to feel better anyway. Uh, but this is one of the, the rare instances where it's okay to give an antibiotic for a viral illness, right? Anyway, um, zithromycin tends to be considerably more expensive. The other benefits given less frequently, so that could be kind of a, um, you know, a decision point for, for you and your patient to make if they don't feel like they can be very compliant with it otherwise, uh, but not use it nearly as often as the erythromycin is. Yes? Is it soothing to the eye because you're doing it so frequently and you're just irrigating? Yeah. Um, well, you're not really irrigating because it's more of an ointment that you're administering for the, the erythromycin. It's just having a nice kind of an occlusive um, kind of uh, something that's very much formulated, similar to like tears or other you know, solutions on the eye, where it just kind of you know, blocks out other you know, exposure to air and, and things like that. So I think that's kind of the, the big reason for that. But yeah, constant administration could be another thing that could, you know, it sticks around for longer too because remember that um, with ointments, they tend to have a lot uh, higher... Um, time they stick around for than something like a solution that can just get washed away with the tears. Yep. Uh, next, we have uh, trimethoprim and polymyxin B. This is a common combination drug we'll see here called polytrim. And again, trimethoprim, how's that working? Folic yeah, blocks folic acid uh, utilization within the bacteria, so that's going to affect DNA uh, uh, production. And then we also have polymyxin B. Do you guys remember how that was used? 
Yeah, it's a cell wall inhibitor, right? So again, uh, a different combination than what we saw with, because typically you see trimethoprim mixed with a um, with a sulfa drug like sulfamethoxazole. Typically, so this is kind of an odder combination that you don't normally see for like systemic therapy, because we know polymyxin B is not very good when given IV or given systemically, lots of toxicities associated with that. But topically, you're probably going to be fine for this. So again, um, only issues with this, uh, maybe a little bit of ocular irritation, but other than that, it's, it's pretty decent. So again, depending on your patient, uh, depending on what their insurance is like, um, depending on what previous antibiotics they've received, uh, this may lead you to picking erythromycin versus this or one or the other. It just depends on, on your patient, right? So we'll look at some specific indications when you want to choose specific antibiotics, but here's kind of a grab bag. You choose really whatever you like. You do have sulfacetamide just by itself. So again, this would have the same mechanism as sulfamethoxazole. So again, affecting folic acid synthesis. Um, and again, nothing really specific here. Uh, the only thing to note is if a patient has uh, a sulfa allergy, right? So a specific sulfonamide allergy to something like Ceftra or Bactrim, um, they could have a, a local reaction here as well, right? They're probably not gonna go anaphylactic, but it could make um, the, the inflammation worse. And so that would be one thing to avoid for your patients. I don't see this one used nearly as much, uh, probably most often for a lot of like, kind of easy, fast track, ED kind of encounters. I see a lot of erythromycin. I see a lot of polytrim uh, being used for those patients. It's probably the most common two that I'll see. Also, bacitracin that's available as well. Again, this one's going to be working on cell wall synthesis. Um, typically used as a topical medication found in you know, a lot of like your uh, cuts and scrapes kind of ointments. Um, we can also use this in the eye as well. And again, this one comes as an ointment. So again, it'll be uh, administered as, as inches instead of uh, drops necessarily. Okay, so specifically here, now we have our fluoroquinolones. So you have things like uh, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. Moxy is probably the most common one I see being used. Uh, so it's a Vigimox, and then also the ofloxacin as well is, is occasionally used. Again, these are working on uh, damaging the DNA by inhibiting topoisomerase and DNA gyrase. Um, this is going to be interesting. These are going to be more specifically used for things like uh, corneal ulcers. So it can help to, to treat that. Um, and the big thing to note is that this is going to have activity against... Pseudomonas, right? So this is going to have pseudomonal activity. So this may be a thing where a patient comes in, you're suspecting bacterial conjunctivitis, they have a history of uh, contact lens wear. Uh, this may be one thing where you say, hey, this is probably where we should utilize uh, something like a fluoroquinolone. This may be some, some moxifloxacin. Actually, this came up, uh, I was doing site visits for one of the students in the upper class, and they actually had a case very similar to this where a um, patient had a history of um, contact lens wear coming in for conjunctivitis and so it's one of those things where it's like okay well did you think about pseudomonas like yeah but she hadn't used contact lenses for like the past you know three months and so again you have to make sure you get a good history of that to make sure that you're you're using the right kind of medication so you end up going with something kind of like a, a an erythromycin or something we've already talked about right so just keep that in mind um as far as uh, adverse reactions go you can see this white precipitate that forms a ciprofloxacin it's kind of a unique thing there um again they could you just need to educate them about it so they're not kind of freaked out when they see this kind of white you know, gunk in their eye already. And you can't have an unpleasant taste after giving it. Why do you think you have an unpleasant taste? Yeah, so think about the drainage where it's going to go. Eventually, it kind of empties out back into the nose and into the back of the throat. So that's where they can get that taste from. So it kind of makes sense there. They get no drug interactions here because it's only being applied topically. Okay, um, so this is going to be preferred if you have a corneal ulcer, if any kind of pseudomonal infection that you're worried about. Um, again, they tend to be much more expensive than uh, something like a polytrim or an erythromycin, so you really kind of want to hold back on these unless um, you have one of these kind of compelling indications to use. We, we are starting to see some resistance emerging here, not nearly as bad as you see for like orally administered Leviquin or Cipro or something like that, but certainly this can be a concern, so that's why we again, want to hold them back if we can. So again, prefer for conjunctivitis and contact lens wearers. Um, what's the other big thing to educate patients on? If they have, uh, they're using contact lenses, they have this conjunctivitis, you're uh, admin or you know prescribing, uh, you know, ofloxacin for them. What's the other big thing to tell them as far as their contact lens wear? Can't wear contact. contact lens and throw them away. Yeah. So again, some people might want to be a little bit more frugal and try to recycle them or something, but it's not not good. No, the, the drug still works exactly the same. It's just a problem of how long is it going to stick around for. So again, um, you get those kind of high local concentrations, but then if it get washed away very quickly, um, you know, you don't achieve those concentrations for very long. So, um, you know, again, this is something where could you get away with using less frequent dosing? 
possibly. It just depends on how severe the infection is. Um, this is just what, when they did the studies, that's what they got approval for, essentially, is for that, that frequent dosing. So maybe one of those things where sometimes you see the dosing changes over time, um, but it's usually related back to people doing the research and finding out, like, hey, can we get away with less frequent dosing? You know, does that still work? All right, we have a few aminoglycosides we use. Uh, gentamicin and tobramycin are the most common ones. Um, gentamicin is a very common one you see getting used. Uh, do you know what patient gets a one-time dose of gentamicin? Yeah, babies, yeah. So as soon as you're born, uh, typically you ever see uh, it was something I was prepared for, but, you know, I remember, you know, back in the days, it was like, why do newborn babies always have, like, such goopy-looking eyes? Like, what is, what are they getting on their face? Um it's not from mom, but you are treating it because you want to make sure they don't get an infection from anything from mom, right? So they have a vaginal birth. Um, you know, you can pick up bacteria in the in the birth tract. So in order to prevent any kind of ocular infections, you'll do a kind of a one-time dose of genomycin on the eyes, um, and that's usually enough to prevent any infections from happening. So that's kind of the, the more common case you'll see used for gentamicin. <clears throat> Certainly. Um, we don't use these very as frequently because one of the things you can see, especially with longer term use, is you can actually have uh, further conjunctivitis developed from this, right? So um, you know, you're treating someone for bacterial conjunctivitis and they end up getting even worse potentially or it doesn't get any better. Um, that could be related back to this. Also, you can see things like corneal ulceration that can develop over time. So this is usually why we don't recommend these as frequently as something like erythromycin or polytrim or something like that. Okay, uh, I'm not sure why I included this slide. This is probably a remnant from when I had to reorganize things, so disregard this one. But you already know all this stuff, so it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about some ocular antivirals that we have here. So typically, you know, a lot of the, the viral conjunctivitis uh, that people get, do we have any drugs for that? Probably adenovirus and things. No, so again, it's, it's mostly just supportive care for those patients. There are some um, unique cases where we're treating things like um, herpes zoster, cytomegalovirus, so we'll have some antivirals that we can use. Again, these are mostly going to be more immunocompromised patients you're going to see this with, so they're not going to use it as frequently, um, but just be aware that um, there could be some compelling indications for this. So um, the only two that I'm going to focus on here uh, are going to be this trifluridine and this gancyclovir. Um, we've kind of covered gancyclovir previously, but um, note that most of these other medications they can use, you can most often get away with using things like um, uh, systemic therapy, right? So if you had a herpes infection in the eye, you may get acyclovir being given systemically. I, because we're just covering the ophthalmology section now, I just want to cover things that are given you know, ophthalmically uh, in this case. Those are the two drugs you would remember from this section here uh, regarding this, this topic specifically. So trifluridine, uh, this one is actually working by inhibiting this thymidylate synthetase and it gets incorporated into viral DNA in place of thymidine. So instead of being a guanine analog, it ends up becoming a thymine uh, analog or thymidine analog. Um, Again, usually used for keratoconjunctivitis, specifically for herpes infections. Um, the only thing to note as far as, as side effects goes is kind of unique punctate keratopathy you can see here. Why do you think the eyes glowing so weird? Hmm? Yeah, so it's a fluorescein stain with under with a woods lamp, right? So you use a black light to, to light that up. So that's you can see that potentially with, with use of this uh, as a, po a possible side effect. I'm not sure if it actually causes any um, actual issues of vision that I'm not sure about, but it is a unique thing you can see with this drug specifically. And then you have gancyclovir. Again, this is, um, I mentioned that in the uh, course of like antivirals that you would administer to patients, usually acyclovir, valacyclovir, kind of the, the go-to drugs for systemic use. Um, gancyclovir ends up getting kind of held back for things like cytomegalovirus. In this case, this is where you're gonna most often um, utilize this. Similar mechanism as acyclovir, again, it's kind of being a guanine analog that gets incorporated into that DNA. Um, this is one we're more likely to see it being used as an insert. So I kind of mentioned that that insert you can actually put into the bulb of the eye. Um, that allows for a kind of nice uh, sustained release of drug. Uh, you have a nice high levels that can kill off that virus, hopefully for those more immunocompromised patients. So you can see here some pictures of uh, intravitreal injections that you have administered there. Again, very freaky, I think. I really don't, it's like a saw kind of like uh, situation there. No thanks. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just lose the eye. It's fine. It's fine. No. Okay. Uh, there's a few antifungal uh, meds that we'll have here as well. So again, uh, antifungal, you usually don't see a lot of fungal eye infections, mostly in those immunocompromised patients. Um, natamycin is going to be the only commercially available one that we have here. Um, be aware that you can also use systemic drugs in order to treat those eye infections as well. So we'll see if you kind of um, uh, 
returning members of the antifungal group that we'll, we'll see here in just a few seconds. But again, as we get more and more immunocompromised patients, you're going to see more of these fungal infections, depending on what your patient population it looks like. Um, but some other things that can lead you to more uh, likely to have a fungal infection can include trauma. Uh, you have chronic ocular surface disease. Again, that can lead to, to have kind of more hospitable environment for fungus. Um, contact lens wear can be another thing to, to worry about as, as well. So again, most of these are either going to be oral or intravenous administered medications. So remember things like amphotericin B, we remember our azoles, um, but natamycin will be the only one we'll use topically here. So this is what we're going to focus on for this section. So uh, this is actually going to work by binding to sterols within the fungal cell wall, and will increase that permeability. So you know, again, similarly working on the fungal cell wall, a lot uh, very similar to a lot of the other antifungals we've talked about. Um, just note this is going to be uh, used specifically for conjunctivitis due to the, any of these back, uh, fungal uh, strains. Uh, again, I'm not going to ask you specifically does this treat Candida versus Aspergillus. I'm, I'm not going to get that grand there for this purpose. Um, and again, no specific side effects noted with it. And again, it's going to be one of those things where, you know, on test questions, it might be patient presents, you're concerned about, uh, you know, a viral um, uh, conjunctive virus, which one of these meds would be most appropriate, and I'll put like, you know, two antibiotics, antifungal, antiviral, your job is to pick out which one is the antiviral, right? So it's not kind of similar to what we saw on the previous test, right? Anywho, so when you're you're dealing with these patients who are complaining of conjunctive virus, you've probably already uh, heard a lot of this. Um, but you always want to make sure you're documenting visual acuities to make sure they're not, you're looking for changes. Essentially, you're looking for that delta uh, over time. So you want to get a baseline. Uh, if they have any kind of previous uh, documentation, you want to look for that as well to make sure there's been no changes that are occurring there. Um, document any kind of allergies to medications because you already talked about things like sulfa allergies can be important here. Um, and then obviously just document, document, document. Uh, and then obviously if visual acuity is getting worse, especially while they're on treatment, that's where they need to typically get referred out to ophthalmology. Um, that's going to be one of those things where uh, you know you don't want to be messing with it. If it gets a little too complicated, like let someone who does that all the time uh, handle that. Um, basically, how to administer, have you covered how to actually administer these meds previously? Okay, so we'll cover this briefly. Um, first thing, the most important thing to do when giving ocular meds, wash your hands. People get grody hands, and that's probably why they got a nasty bacterial infection in the first place. So make sure they wash their hands, right? Um, this should be as sterile as possible. Those, um, and this is why, again, another big thing when you're dealing with like eye drops is to tell them not to share it with other people. Because again, people are grody, they're gonna share their cooties with one another and that can lead to people spreading infection, right? So you wanna keep these as sterile, as clean as possible when you're administering these and that starts in the hands. Um, Again, what you're going to have the patient do is tilt their head back, and basically you're going to be pulling down the lower eyelid, just going to form that nice pocket. That's kind of what you're aiming for to, uh, to administer uh, the medication into. Basically, you're going to, um, while you're holding that down, you're going to use the opposite hand to instill the drops. Again, you don't want to touch the eye specifically. You want to keep it kind of in the air, but then instill the drops into that little pocket um, and, and to get how many ever drops you need, in, whether it's one to two drops or so, into the actual eye. Next thing you want to do is have the patient kind of tilt their head forward, and then you want to put pressure there right on the bridge of the nose. And what's that going to do for us? Yes, it prevents, yeah, so it prevents that nasal lacrimal drain. So it's going to help the meds stick around for a little bit longer, for a few more minutes. Uh, you know, let them do that for two to three minutes or so. Allow that drug to kind of sit there, to kind of uh, simmer a little bit, and allow it to, to get, have its, its mechanism there. Once you're done, wipe away any excess, and then wash the hands again, right? As far as drops versus, oh, yes, sir. Um, if you were administering it, yeah, possibly. A lot of patients are probably not going to have uh, gloves available, so it's okay if you do it with bare hands, but again, just make sure you're washing your hands first. This is kind of more like education for when you're telling the patient how they're going to do it at home, how to administer, but yeah, certainly you'd probably, in the clinical setting, have gloves on to, to avoid that. You should wash your hands anyway, too, even if you have gloves. It's a good habit. Um, Anywho, uh, drops versus ointment. So the big thing here is that ointments tend to be better for children um, because, again, they have pretty poor compliance. Like, uh, I try to administer oral uh, Tylenol to my child, and it is uh, immediately spit back upon me. So I imagine trying to give her an eye drop would be even more difficult, right? So uh, the nice thing with the ointments is even if you just get it on the eyelashes, it's still making some contact, and it's probably fine, right? So they're probably getting enough concentration of the drug there, um, just as they're blinking, kind of getting the eye, uh, some contact there, that it, it, it'll still work. Um, so that's kind of one, one benefit there. The other thing with ointments is it tends to blur the vision. So if they need to, like, get in a car and drive somewhere, that's not going to be super useful for them um, until their vision kind of clears up. So again, kind of pluses and minuses on both sides. 
Um, the only difference with application of gels or ointments is that you're basically squeezing uh, considered a ribbon of drug onto, you know, whether it's half an inch or an inch or whatever it happens to be uh, onto the eye. Um, there's no need to cover that lacrimal duct because again, the drug is viscous enough where it's not going to start to uh, wash away immediately, right? Um, has anyone ever glued their eye shut with super glue or known someone who has done this? Because kids get into stuff like. See, okay, so your sister glued her lips shut. You probably enjoyed that day. It was probably a good time, right? I was, I was very young at the time. Okay. You're like, I oh, enjoy the silence. Yes. Um, <laughs> So again, uh, this is something you can certainly see where kids get into super glue. They start gluing things together, and unfortunately, I've seen a few cases where they actually glue their eyes shut. Um, which you can actually do in this. I just kind of mentioned this as, as if you ever see it, you can you can look like a rock star and you're like, oh, I know exactly what to do. Um, basically, what you can actually do is use something like an erythromycin ointment. The the big thing is to use an ointment on that because the kind of the oily base of that is going to help to dissolve that uh, the super glue is cyanoacrylate, but basically it can help to start to dissolve it. And so you basically just apply it to the eye and eventually as they kind of just naturally are trying to blink, um, it's gonna eventually kind of loosen that up and then their eye will open up and you've saved the day, right? You don't have to go around like a pirate the rest of their lives. So, <laughs> Anywho, little little fun trivia. We had um, we had one kid who came in, and um, one of the things you'll you'll note is things like drain cleaners. Um, does anyone know what the pH of a drain cleaner is? Like Mr. Plumber, or... it's actually very basic. So it's usually sodium hydroxide, um, and so it ends up being a very high pH. And if, what you'll learn uh, if you ever get look into chemical burns is that typically bur bases burn a lot worse than acids do because they just they they burn for a lot longer. Um, so we had these two kids, and they were typical Duval County residents. They were out playing in the backyard. Uh, and they were tossing around a, a liquid plumber bottle back and forth to one another because that's the best toy they had at the time. Um, <laughs> tossing it back and forth, and then all of a sudden the cap came off. One kid got a, a little drop of it into his eye, and so immediately starts screaming, huge amount of pain, like really, really bad. Um, and so the, the next thing you're supposed to do for those is to really try to flush them out, right? So uh, dilution is usually the solution to pollution, as they say. Um, so you want to use as much uh, flushing as you can, normal saline, tap water, whatever you got to try to wash that stuff away and try to achieve uh, back a normal pH. Um, so the kid ends up coming over to the PET ER. Um, kid's freaking out. They're, you know, just, just not able to really get, uh, again, to hold still long enough to um, kind of apply anything we need to. And so uh, one of the things we had to do is actually give him a drug called ketamine. So I've kind of mentioned ketamine before. It's a very good anesthetic uh, sedative. And basically we were able to give him that, calm him down enough to like where he's laying still. And then we uh, applied what we called a Morgan lens. Anyone ever heard of a Morgan lens? It's not really a cup over the eyes. It looks like a contact lens with like a little tube coming out of the middle of it. Yeah, so basically we were able to apply that and then you hook that up to a bag of saline and just let it run wide open. That way you get a ton of flushing out. Um, that's one thing you may see uh, being utilized. Another thing, a uh, neat trick you can do is if um, you need flushing uh, of the eyes, you can actually use a nasal cannula and basically put that over the bridge of the nose, hook that up to a bag of saline and have that work as well. Because again, you kind of want the, the direction of water to be kind of going away from the eye. Um, and so that's one thing you can do. So little tricks uh, you can do if you ever have someone with uh, some ocular irritation there. Anywho, um, so again, contact lenses, um, they should discontinue use, as we've kind of already mentioned. Um, you can start to use them again when you've had no discharge, the eye's not inflamed for about 24 hours or so. But they really need to utilize a, a new set of contact lenses and not try to disinfect them anyhow, you know, uh, hydrogen peroxide or anything like that. You really just get rid of them. The other thing you have to mention, and I'm very sorry if, you know, you buy expensive makeup, you got to throw it away, right? So all the stuff from Sephora, Ulta, it's no good anymore. It's dead to you. <laughs> A lot of people are very like attached to their stuff. Like my wife has this uh, thing of some sort of makeup, but she's been using it for like a decade, it seems like. So she's like, look, I can almost see the bottom now. Like, great, but you gotta throw it away if you ever get an eye infection. So I tell her. <laughs> Anywho, uh, so moving on, let's talk about allergy. Uh, kind of allergic conjunctivitis, what stuff we can use uh, to treat this. Obviously, the, the big thing we're going to be focusing on are the, the inflammatory cytokines being released by things like your basophils and your mast cells. Uh, obviously, one of the big uh, uh, major kind of mediators here is going to be Histamine, yeah, histamine is going to be a big deal. So we're going to be focusing on histamine primarily for a lot of these medications. Um, but we're also going to be talking about what we call mast cell stabilizers, or MCS. And what, what do you think that does? prevents that degranulation, right? So you prevent the release of a lot of those uh, inflammatory cytokines. So that's again, we'll see that some drugs have a little bit of both activity with their antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. Then we'll look at specifically some mast cell stabilizers. 
Other things you can see, platelet activating factor, leukotrienes, other things like that, where they are causing a local inflammation, see a lot of swelling, a lot of vasodilation, redness, itching, all of that. Is, I'm sure everyone's experienced some of this at some point in their life. And again, uh, just looking at the, the effects of the histamine, once these degranulate, you're going to get a lot of vasodilation. Uh, the capillaries become more leaky, and that's where you see a lot of the edema, a lot of tearing, things like that forming. Okay, so again, we're going to utilize uh, our, our H1 receptor antagonists. We've kind of covered a few of these already. Um, you'll see that the ocular meds are much, uh, it's a much different list than what we'll see with, um, with our ANT drugs that we talked about previously. Um, but again, they're going to be working on histamine that's already been released from the mast cells, right? So again, it's one of those things where if you're having an acute inflammatory reaction, like these are going to be useful because you've already got the histamine out there. You're just trying to block the receptors from being activated. We're going to look at some other drugs where that's not going to be quite so good once you're already having kind of an acute issue. Uh, okay, so the, the big ones you're going to see, again, these are going to have some mast cell stabilizing properties. You got things like azelastine, uh, alcaftadine, uh, bepistastine. Again, a lot of these you don't use very commonly. Uh, probably the most common one I see is like imidastine being used here. And then ketotyphen is important because that one is available over the counter. Um, so you ever see someone uh, get uh, Zatador, uh, they can get that from some pharmacies. And so that is something they can uh, utilize themselves for kind of self-treatment. What's kind of the problem with patients kind of self-treating their uh, ocular uh, woes? Exactly. Yeah. So they might have the wrong diagnosis. So again, they keep getting this allergic conjunctivitis. They think, hey, it's just, it just must be the, the season. Uh, they keep applying it. They don't realize that there could be kind of ongoing damage being done if it's a bacterial infection or something else. Um, so this can delay uh, someone actually coming in to get the evaluation they really need. So just be aware of that. Educate patients that, hey, you know, it's okay to, to um, you know, kind of self-treat in some cases, but if things are not getting better, if things are getting worse, if your vision's changing, you need to come in and get evaluated. So that's a good education point to note there. Uh, Olopatidine is another common one. I see patinol or patidae uh, is, is a common one. Again, dosing usually one to two times a day. This is going to be more often used as kind of an as-needed sort of thing. Um, for patients who have pretty reliable, like, seasonal allergies where they know, like, hey, for this couple of months, I know I'm going to be uh, kind of a big a watery mess. Like, go ahead and, you know, you can utilize that more on a, on a schedule basis. That's totally fine. And this is going to be working much more quickly than what we'll see with uh, just specifically mast cell stabilizers. Because, again, it's working on the, the histamine that's already been released. Um, so that's why it's going to work a little bit better. Usually allow for about two weeks or so to assess for that kind of full efficacy. Uh, and again, as far as irritation goes, um, same thing here, but you can see a little bit of ocular dryness. And why do you think that is? Yeah, because remember we talked about antihistamines having a little bit of anticholinergic action previously, right? Because again, that's why we like to use it for ENT stuff because it helps to dry out the uh, you know nasal drainage and things like that. Same thing can happen here. So you may see a little bit of ocular dryness associated with this. So just be aware of that. You know, drug interactions, and we're going to prefer these over the mast cell stabilizers. And we'll talk about why that is in just a second. Um, so again, the mast cell stabilizers, um, they only work if the mast cells have not already degranulated. They've already released a ton of histamine for an acute reaction, like you're not going to see really any benefit from give, giving these medications. But what we can do is hopefully prevent future uh, uh, release uh, from these mast cells. And so this is going to be kind of more of a prophylactic type of drug than what we see with the antihistamines, which can be more of kind of a directly therapeutic sort of thing. Um, and so again, uh, you need to give these more regularly. Um, these are typically going to be more uh, used for patients who um, cannot tolerate uh, an ocular antihistamine for whatever reason. So again, I don't see a ton of use of these, but occasionally it's going to include things like cromelin, uh, ladoxamide, and netocromel. So those are the, the most common ocular mast cell stabilizers. <clears throat> Again, you need to make sure they're utilizing these for at least two weeks to kind of assess for efficacy, and they're not going to be good for acute symptoms. So this would not be an as-needed sort of drug. This would be a scheduled, um, you know, two times a day, four times a day, whatever it happens to be. They most often require pretty frequent dosings. That's, again, why they're not used very frequently, because it's just not um, super ideal for a lot of your patients. And that nothing to note with those guys. So you can also have uh, some vasoconstrictors that can be utilized here. So just like we saw, you guys remember what the nasal vasoconstrictor we used for ENT stuff was? Afrin. And you guys remember what the generic for Afrin is? Yeah, oxymetazolin. So again, it's good to note the, the name there because you'll see like the oxymetazolin. Yeah, it's good. Um, so you'll see very similar name drugs here because, again, these are all those imidazoline derivatives. Again, they, they activate those alpha-2 receptors, but in very high concentrations given locally, they'll still activate alpha receptors as well. Uh, so these drugs are doing the same thing here. So we have tetrahydrosolin, nefazolin, veniramine. 
in the Fazlin. So this is actually a combination product. We have antihistamine mixed with uh, a vasoconstrictor. And so this is really only going to help with that kind of hyperemia. Uh, it's going to help with uh, vasoconstricting those blood vessels um, and helping to kind of get rid of that red eye, right? You know, lots of over-the-counter varieties of this you can find um, available, lots of different brand names that are out there. So again, that's why it's good to know the generic, so you at least can go back and say, well, at least I know what type of drug that is based on the generic formulation. So again, this is better for short-term use, so usually less than two weeks, because remember what happened if you use Afrin for too long? Rebound. Yeah, rebound rhinitis. So same thing happens here, you can get rebound hyperemia after discontinuation. It's a great counseling point for your patients to make sure not to use it all the time, just only use it kind of as needed. And again, if they have no improvement in you know 72 hours or so, they really need to uh, uh, come in, get an evaluation, and see if there's something else going on that they're not really catching. And again, just remember, uh, again, systemically, alpha-2 receptors tend to decrease sympathetic outflow. So that's where you run into issues where um, you know you think like a bottle of Visine, um, you know, is pretty innocuous over the counter product, but if a kid gets into that and swallows it, um, I had a few cases of that where they get profoundly hypotensive, bradycardic due to these alpha-2 effects. So again, those are very dangerous drugs, and that's why we make sure we have good education on keeping drugs away from from kids, especially stuff like that, because it's definitely a cardioactive uh, drug. We do have some NSAIDs that are available uh, that we can utilize. Again, it's going to have the same mechanism that we see with um, uh, NSAIDs that we utilize for kind of anti purposes, uh, antipyretics, analgesics. Same thing uh, working here to block uh, cyclooxygenase uh, and preventing all the kind of byproducts of arachidonic acid. Um, uh, you know, transformation here. So again, prostaglandins are going to be the, the biggest thing that we're affecting here. So um, these are going to be good if you have kind of um, not just for like a typical like allergic conjunctivitis, you're probably not going to use these NSAIDs for that all that too often. This is most often going to be like in the post-surgical setting where someone has um, you know, a lot of uh, post-op ocular inflammation. These are going to be uh, used primarily for that. And we'll see some other drugs that we can use as well. But um, we have things like bromfenac, diclofenac, flubiprofen, ketorolac or ketorolac, and then the pafenac. So you kind of notice kind of a, a similar naming there. Um, anyone ever heard of ketorolac before or ketorolac? What's another name for it? Yeah, usually I am. Anyone know the name of that? Or have Toradol? Yeah, yeah Toradol is kind of a common one you hear like in the ER, people get like an IM shot of Toradol. Um, if you ever hear someone who's allergic to Toradol, probably they're drug seeking if I had to guess. I'm allergic to Toradol, I can't receive that. I have to get my, my uh, Dilaudid. Okay, sure, whatever you say. Um, Anywho, so again, these are ocular NSAIDs you're going to be utilizing for, these, uh, for some of these patients, most often for postoperative inflammation and pain. Occasionally, if they kind of fail other medications like antihistamines or mast cell stabilizers, maybe for allergic conjunctivitis, but not routinely recommended for those cases. So we see a lot of it being done for our post-op um, optho kids, uh, but we really don't use it much more than that. Um, adverse reactions go, the, you can see uh, some lacrimation, keratitis, some other irritation, but uh, this can be important for patients with uh, pre-existing glaucoma. They can increase the intraocular mm -hmm. pressure. And so we're going to see some issues with that when we talk about glaucoma in just a few slides. <clears throat> Now, if your NSAIDs were not working, then as a backup to that, you could utilize glucocorticoids. So again, these are um, uh, sparingly used because again, we're going to see some side effects associated with them. But again, think about uh, you know NSAIDs working at the site of arachidonic acid, but you know the glucocorticoids working even higher up on the chain. Again, these are much more powerful as far as uh, anti-inflammatories go, but they tend to take a little bit longer to work because again, they have to work at the site of the nucleus changing gene transcription, protein production, things like that. Um, so we can utilize the glucocorticoids for severe ocular allergies that have been unresponsive to other um, drugs, uh, anterior uveitis, uh, any kind of external eye inflammatory disease, um, or inflammation following ocular surgery. Those are the most common cases you're going to see uh, this being used. Again, if you're just kind of working in general, um, you know, family practice, urgent cares, you're not going to be prescribing this a lot, but you may see the ophthalmologist uh, more often prescribing these uh, for if they have a you know, compelling indication to do so. You may actually see some being used intraocularly, so you can see this occasionally for uh, patients who will administer just directly in the eye during surgery. Again, we all know the the kind of the, the actions of the glucocorticoids, how they're uh, immunosuppressive, also anti-inflammatory by kind of affecting all, all uh, aspects of this. So that detail. But uh, basically, the reason why we're going to use these uh, for more refractory symptoms, we don't jump to the steroids first, is because you can see things like increased cataract formation, right? Uh, you can see elevated intraocular pressure, especially if patients have a history of that or a history of glaucoma. This can be problematic for them. Also, risk for infections, because we know this is to be immunosuppressive. Um, you can see delayed wound healing in some cases. So that can be bad if you have like a, um, uh, I'm trying to think, can't think of the word now. 
corneal abrasion or something like that can delay the healing of that. Um, it can also cause some corneal ulcers, right? So this is typically why we learn it to limit the use of these to less than two weeks. Um, it'd be a very uh, odd indication that you need to use it for longer than that. Maybe someone like a really severe uh, autoimmune condition, but typically very short course, only for refractory symptoms most likely. So the agents we have here include things like uh, familiar drugs like dexamethasone, prednisolone, we kind of covered these already. Um, you also have uh, things like our, what we call soft steroids. And these are actually kind of more like second generation kind of steroids that have a lower risk to increase intraocular pressure. So this includes things like fluoromethalone, um, uh, lodopredinol, and then remexalone. Um, Trimsemolin is another one we see most commonly for like, intravitreal injection. So just kind of be familiar with what these uh, drugs are. I know we like when uh, a good indication would be to use these, and but also the side effects you can see with them. You don't typically see a lot of like systemic side effects from this um, due to not having a really good absorption of those. So that's kind of another benefit uh, as opposed to using systemic therapy. Okay, and then uh, as far as therapy goes for, for dry eyes, anyone remember these commercials? I said this to another class and they were just like, what are you talking about? And I was like, getting so old. Um, so dry eyes is another pretty common complaint for a lot of uh, a lot of patients. Um, obviously, there are many conditions that can affect that that tear film. Um, you know, you can have certainly uh, chemical burns is uh, one of the big ones that I deal with on a somewhat routine basis. Um, anything can alter tear composition, uh, the kind of ocular surface can lead to this kind of dry eye issue. Uh, there's also a lot of like uh, autoimmune conditions and other diseases that can lead to this as well. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, vitamin A deficiencies, Stevens Johnson syndrome can all be uh, kind of common reasons for for dry eyes. So as far as treatment options go, you want to treat the disease first, whatever happened to be the, the reason why they uh, have dry eyes to begin with, so that's going to be good. And then uh, you can also use uh, physical interventions. So this is where we can do things like having punctal plugs, or you can actually have surgical occlusion of a lacrimal drainage where you'd actually just uh, cauterize off the, the nasal lacrimal duct and that will keep tears around for longer. So that's gonna be one thing you can do potentially. And then there's also uh, many tear substitutes that we're gonna use. Most of these are either gonna be hypo or isotonic solutions. They typically contain a lot of electrolytes, um, maybe sort of some factants, some thickeners, things to kind of help them stick around for longer to kind of act like better tears essentially. Um, this will all help to increase that time in the cul-de-sac. And so we have things like balanced salt solutions. If you hear like BSS, uh, that's what they're talking about there. Um, carboxymethyl cellulose, hydroxypropyl cellulose, polyvinyl alcohol, all these basic things, artificial tears, lacquer lube, um, those are all going to be good tear substitutes. There's not really one better than the other, and there's really not a whole lot of uh, issues with utilizing these. And again, if you ever see like, um, uh, for instance, an intubated patient, um, if you ever see orders for them uh, uh, for having artificial tears, why do you think that is? If somebody's like sedated, intubated in the ICU. Yeah, they're not really blinking a whole lot, uh, especially if they're paralyzed, that can be another thing, right? So if you have them on a paralytic, um, they're not going to be able to blink on their own. So they, this is another really important thing to apply there, because otherwise they can develop um, very severe dry eye damage to the, the cornea. So that can be a uh, big thing to, to worry about. So again, little things you may not think about unless you kind of see it in, in the hospital setting. We do have one immunomodulator uh, that can be utilized for patients with like really chronic dry eyes. And so this is going to be a drug called cyclosporin. This is actually a drug we can use systemically as an immunosuppressant for patients with uh, transplants. Uh, but we can use it in the eye. And basically what it's going to do is lead to less T-cell activation uh, by decreasing uh, production and release of interleukin-2. Basically it's decreasing uh, inflammatory uh, or inflammation via this specific pathway. Um, you end up seeing increased tear production, improved vision comfort for the patients. So that can be uh, really good for them if they've kind of failed a lot of other therapies. And so um, biggest adverse reactions is it's pretty irritating to the eyes. So you can see things like a lot of ocular burning, uh, foreign body sensations. So that's why again, we like to hold off on it. It's typically a lot more expensive than something like a lacquer lube or a BSS solution is going to be. Okay, um, so I just want to cut it there. Uh, let's do a 10 minute break and we'll come back and start off with the glaucoma. So have you guys covered anything with glaucoma yet? Not the glaucoma. Okay, uh, so we'll cover this again. We have the drug therapy. Um, so glaucoma is going to be characterized obviously by increased intraocular pressure, this ocular hypertension. Uh, what's the problem with that? Why do we care? Maybe rupture of the globe. It's more likely to see kind of long-term chronic issues. Loss of vision, right? So we like to keep our patients seeing as long as we can. Uh, obviously, that pressure uh, on the optic nerve is going to be uh, detrimental over time. So that's really the big thing we're worried about. There's two varieties. Uh, there's going to be open and closed angle. Uh, the drugs that we're going to talk about today are going to focus on the open angle. Closed angle glaucoma is usually more of a kind of an immediate surgical kind of issue. Um, that's one of those things where uh, which one is typically painful? 
the clothes is typically painful. That's one of the things where like they're complaining like really severe eye pain. Um, that is going to be more like I mentioned, a kind of an emergent surgical issue. The open angle glaucoma typically uh, has really no symptoms associated with it until the vision starts to take a hit, right? We're gonna be focusing on two things. Uh, we're focusing on one, decreasing the aqueous humor production, right? And then the other thing is to try to increase the outflow through the trabecular mesh work. And so we're going to see that our drugs can work on one or both of these mechanisms. And so it's important to remember that when we're choosing things like combination drugs, like, you know, can we get some synergy here by working on, say, uh, these different pathways? So normal ocular pressure anywhere between like 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. And that pressure, uh, once it gets high enough, you know, we consider that ocular hypertension. Um, and I mentioned the open angle glaucoma usually uh, due to increased either uh, production of aqueous humor or due to that decreased drainage. Okay. Uh, versus the angle closure glaucoma or closed angle is usually uh, actual just a physical blockage of that drainage canal. Um, again, usually going to be an acute pain. So it's kind of a picture kind of showing the difference between that open angle. You see here that, you know, there's some diminished flow here, but it's not going to be nearly as severe as you see as this actual whole uh, blockage here with a closed angle. All right, so our goal here, again, we'd like to prevent uh, this optic nerve damage and try to minimize that risk of side effects associated with the drugs. This is where we're gonna see more systemic side effects from some of these uh, agents as we'll go forward. So we wanna be careful with that. And then um, uh, we'll talk about some other things there. So again, remember where the, the actual aqueous humor is produced? Think about the, well, that's where it's gonna leave eventually, right? Yeah, ciliary bias is going to be uh, produced here, again, um, as it's going to go through across the lens, go over the iris, and then that's where eventually you can go through that, uh, that canal of schlem, as they say. Um, it's my favorite organ of the body, or uh, section of the body. Anywho, um, so that's going to be what we're focusing on, either decreasing the production here in the ciliary body or trying to increase the outflow. So a few different drugs we have here. So in order to increase aqueous outflow, we have our prostaglandins, which are typically your first line agents. Um, you're gonna have alpha adrenergic agonists. We're also gonna have our cholinergic agonists. Okay, we're gonna look at these uh, in more detail as we go forward, but uh, just to kind of give you an idea of how the, the breakdown of these agents. As far as decreasing aqueous production, we're gonna have also our alpha adrenergic agonists. So these are kind of working, doing double duty here. We're also gonna have our beta blockers which are gonna be more of a kind of a second line agent. And so there's probably some, this will depend on your patient. So uh, between the prostaglandins and the beta blockers, you're gonna find that it's kind of a one, two kind of um, situation where depending on your patient, you may choose one versus the other. And we'll talk about those decision points uh, in just a few minutes here. So depending on who you talk to, they may recommend beta blockers over prostaglandins. I would probably recommend prostaglandins, but we'll, we'll talk about those uh, judgments here in just a second. And then finally, the carbonic and hydrase inhibitors uh, are going to work to help decrease uh, that production. Um, we'll talk about these a lot when we get to diuretics as well. So this will come up again. But again, oftentimes you're going to need multiple agents to control that intraocular pressure. So combination therapy is usually uh, uh, more, the, the, more the, the rule than the exception. You'll see in a lot of cases. So starting out, we have our prostaglandins, and so these are going to be analogs of PGF2-alpha, and basically it's going to work just the same as that prostaglandin does normally. It's going to bind to prostaglandin receptors, and it will actually uh, lower the intraocular pressure by increasing outflow of that aqueous humor. We don't actually know the full mechanism why this works. We just know that it kind of works. Um, could be due to things like ultraciliary muscle contraction, could be changes in that trabecular mesh work, all sorts of things, but uh, we just know that it works. That's, that's kind of the most important thing. Agents we have here include things like latanoprost, uh, travoprost, uh, bimatoprost, and then uh, tafloprost. So these are kind of the most common ones you're going to run into. Um, probably these first top three are, have been around for longer. You're going to see these uh, more like in a generic form, so they typically be a little bit cheaper. Um, notice here I have two brand names for bimatoprost. Notice here, Latisse. Anyone know what you use that for? Hmm, interesting. So a little cosmetic use of drugs here, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, so some adverse reactions you're gonna see with the prostaglandins. Uh, you can see some conjunctival hyperemia. You can see some ocular irritation with this. And the big thing is changes in eyelash length. So you can see typically increases in eyelash length. And then also iris color is gonna be a potential change here. So typically, anyone know what color changes your iris? Brown, yeah, so nice, beautiful brown, right? So um, this is gonna be one of those things that can uh, say, hey, do you want to uh, have longer eyelashes? Okay, do you want to keep your eyes blue? It's going to be kind of a uh, kind of a judgment call on the patient, right? So this is kind of a conversation you have to have. Um, you know, if you already have brown eyes to begin with, that's probably fine, right? Um, but you know, if, uh, depending on you know if they have uh, any other color, there is a risk that it can change. It may not be reversible in a lot of cases. Um, again, the other big big benefit of the prostaglandins is they have limited systemic side effects. That's another benefit. Uh, even if they have nasolacrimal drainage, you don't really see a lot of systemic effects. 
Here's an example of a patient who is uh, probably just receiving prostaglandin in one eye. Notice here is probably her original eye color that can turn a very dark brown kind of color. So again, if they have concerns about that, this may not be the drug for them, right? So um, this could be just one of those things where it's say, okay, well maybe uh, something like a beta blocker is gonna be a better option for those patients. Um, but you can see here with Latisse, you know, uh, certainly it's kind of applied kind of like similar to like mascara or something like that, where you see increase in the eyelash length, um, which can be pretty, pretty significant. There's probably a possibility of that happening. Yeah, a little bit darker. It depends on how dark the eyes are to begin with. And again, it's not everyone's going to get that, but some patients are maybe more at risk uh, than others. So just something to be uh, be aware of. And again, another big thing here is if you're using for glaucoma, if you're for like an you know, elderly patient, they may not really give a flip, right? But if it's a younger patient who's considering using like Latisse, like they probably need to be educated about that because again, it could be um, could be detrimental for for them depending on um, how how attached to their eye color they are. Um, <laughs> Anywho, this is going to be typically once a daily dosing. Uh, you don't want to exceed that. It's kind of the, one of the benefits. You want to give it one time a day, which is nice. Uh, but you don't actually want to exceed that because, interestingly enough, it can actually inhibit those IOP lowering effects and actually end up increasing the pressure a little bit. So, again, only one time daily dosing. Um, again, this is where if, like, a prostaglandin at a typical standard dose was not working, this is where you might want to add into an additional drug rather than uh, trying to up your dose uh, or give the drug more frequently. All right. Next up, this is probably kind of, again, the prostaglandins beta blockers, kind of a one-two kind of situation, depending on your patient. Um, but obviously, these are blocking beta receptors, right? And so it prevents what from binding to those adrenergic receptors? Like, what are the catecholamines that usually bind to beta receptors? Epinephrine, norepinephrine. Those are kind of the primary ones you're going to see there. Um, so, so anyway, basically, we're blocking those beta receptors, usually in the ciliary body, because this is going to more focus on aqueous humor production. Um, you see less catecholamine activation, decreases cyclic AMP, which you know is a secondary messenger, uh, and it's going to see less aqueous production there. Uh, big thing to note here, we have uh, a few different agents we have here. We have one that is beta-1 selective, means it's going to be primarily affecting just the beta-1 receptors. Uh, this is betaxolol. And we have some that are non-selective. So this includes cardiolol, timolol, and levobunolol. So usually the beta blockers have like an LOL ending on there. Um, so not, nothing funny about that, though. Um, anyway, um, so why do you think it's important to have beta-1 selective versus non-selective? Like, what's the point there? Probably has to do with side effects, absolutely. So beta-1 receptors, where do you primarily find those? On the heart, right? So you think about heart, you think about, you know, causing bradycardia. What about beta-2 receptors? The lungs, right? So you see those on the lungs, right? And those uh, typically, when you activate beta two receptors, what happens to the uh, the bronchial constriction? It relaxes or it squeezes more. Relaxes, right? That's why we use albuterol. It's a beta two agonist. It actually loosens up uh, that smooth muscle there on, uh, around the bronchioles and can open that up. And that's why it's useful for for asthma. Um, so the risk here you want to worry about, because again, these drugs can have some decent systemic effects if they have uh, you know, enough drainage. You can have to see these uh, drugs having systemic problems like causing bradycardia, right? So it could be a problem if you had a patient who says has you know, poor left ejection fraction, they say that's CHF. Could affect people who have things like asthma. So again, you know, if you're blocking those beta-2 receptors and I all of a sudden I'm having an asthma attack, if I take my inhaler, uh, try to activate those beta-2 receptors, it may be less effective because they're all being blocked up. So this is the reason why you may choose a beta-1 selective agent over a non-selective one. So typically when you're asthmatic patients, so that's the kind of the decision point there. Um, so again, this would be better for asthmatic patients. These would be better for um, anyone kind of not really relying on the, that beta-2 uh, effects. So again, non-selective tends to be more efficacious, but more side effects do, again, to uh, they're just being a bigger proportion of beta-2 receptors in the eye. And again, remember, selectivity is only going to be relative. So again, if you have high enough concentrations of a drug at the site, um, there sometimes you can have the numbers to overpower that selectivity and still have beta-2 actions, but typically non-selectives are going to work a little bit better there. Um, but adverse reactions, you know, worsening heart failure, bradycardia, heart block, or that increased airway resistance. So um, keep that in mind. Remember, you know, if you had a question that came up on a test and it said, hey, a patient who is you know, 78 years old, she has uh, CHF uh, and now is newly diagnosed with glaucoma. So she has brown eyes. Um, which would be the best option for her, right? And so you'd say, well, a beta blocker might not be good for her because that can worsen her CHF, but maybe prostaglandin would be a good option, right? She already has brown eyes. It doesn't really matter about changing that. You know, she's, uh, you know, not really hitting the dating scene too hard right now. Uh, maybe prostaglandins are better for her, right? Just in case someone's staring into your eyes, you know, longingly, like, you know. If you already have brown eyes to begin with, it doesn't really matter, right? So, um, again, it's one of those things where you have to kind of evaluate your patient and decide which is the best option for them, right? Or if you had an asthmatic patient, maybe choosing a beta-1 selective agent would be better for them. Uh, so keep, keep those sort of things in mind.
you'll see this is going to be a big, big um, uh, thing we'll focus more on, especially when we get to the cardiology section. We're talking about antihypertensives or CHF meds. There's going to be such a plethora of different options you can use. It's important to evaluate your patient to determine which one's best. And so there's going to be a lot of questions that will come up on these tests where, um, you know, you have this type of patient, what drug is best for them? And you have to know allergies. You have to know contraindications, you know, different factors like that to decide what's best. You wouldn't be worried about these adverse reactions to people that already have, like, existing heart conditions. You could probably see some change in the heart rate for like an otherwise healthy patient, um, but this could be you know more uh, pronounced for those that already have pre-existing conditions. Have you guys presented like do you know the mechanism that causes your iris to change color? Uh, I don't know the mechanism. It probably has something to do with melanin production, if I had to guess. Uh, but I don't know if anyone actually knows the full product. Because again, you know, some of these drugs we don't even know how they work specifically for their therapeutic effect. Uh, getting at the the you know the actual side effects would be even harder to, to delineate. So I'm not very sure. But there, there's probably some papers out there that suggest different mechanisms that, that are out there. But I don't know if there's one unified theory. Yeah. Anyway. So we mentioned, again, beta-1 receptors primarily in the heart. So again, this is responsible for a lot of the cardiac effects versus the beta-2 receptors mostly found in the lungs. We're going to be seeing some bronchodilation, uh, also some vasodilation as well. Because remember, beta-2 uh, receptors are also found on the vasculature. Those are typically going to be more vaso-relaxing uh, um, and more vasodilatory. So it can, again, can have some effects on the blood pressure there. Um, Non-selective agents affect both receptors pretty much equally, but having a uh, beta-1 selective is going to primarily focus on the, just the beta-1 receptors. Okay. Uh, next, we have the alpha adrenergic agonist. This would be kind of, uh, you know, uh, prostaglandins and beta blockers, kind of one and two. Um, this would be maybe like a th uh, number three, right? And so these are, again, are going to be alpha two agonists. These are going to be working um, uh, kind of both locally and then also kind of centrally, as we'll see. So again, presynaptically, they help to decrease that catecholamine release, um, leading to uh, decreased production of, of the aqueous humor, uh, increased outflow. So those are all both good things. And then kind of postsynaptically, they're also going to be working to decrease aqueous production. So again, these are the, the one group of drugs that kind of works on both sides of the fence there to, to both increase outflow and decrease production. Okay, things like apiclonidine and then bromonidine. Um, one of the nice things about apiclonidine is nice because it's uh, ionized at a physiologic pH. And if you remember, um, you know, do things that are ionized or have a charge on them, do they cross the blood-brain barrier particularly well? Typically, no, right? It's just like when we talked about our first versus second generation antihistamines, right? The second generations have a charge on them. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier uh, almost at all. So this is another nice thing. Can I have to limit some of the central side effects? Because typically what you can see with um, some of these um, uh, alpha-2 agonists is because they're sympatholytics or they decrease the sympathetic nervous system, um, you can see things like, you know, depressed mental status, uh, apnea in some cases, and why these drugs are actually be contraindicating kids less than two. They tend to be more susceptible to those effects. So you can see you've seen as depression, apnea associated with that. So again, that's why we worry about it. Um, but hopefully they're going to limit the side effects, especially with apiclonidine, due to it having uh, that, that charge of physiologic pH. Uh, bromonidine, being a little bit more lipophilic, you may see more likely to see uh, some effects there. So just want to be uh, considerate of. All right, and then we have our carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So these are working to specifically inhibit carbonic anhydrase. You guys remember what carbonic anhydrase does? And anhydrase is carbonic acid. So basically it takes CO2 and water, forms bicarbonate out of it, or it takes bicarbonate and forms CO2 and water. I'll show you a diagram here in a second. Uh, but basically, uh, we'll see these are going to be very important in the kidney as well. Uh, a little bit later when we get to the hypertension stuff. But basically, um, this is decreasing the production of bicarbonate ions. This means you're going to have decreased uh, fluid transport uh, and intraocular pressure. So this is working more specifically on aqueous humor production. Uh, we have two drugs here, dorazolamide and brinzolamide. Uh, and so these, again, kind of more third, fourth line kind of agents. Um, can see some bitter taste. Again, it's due to that drainage usually, some burning, sting after administration, and, and some allergic conjunctivitis as a possibility. So again, not kind of the first or second line agent we're going to use, but maybe as a good useful adjunctive agent if our first lines are not really working. Here's kind of a fun picture uh, showing how carbonic anhydrase can be affected here. Again, remember that um, by decreasing the amount of bicarbonate ion production, basically you're kind of decreasing this flow of water form the aqueous humor. So essentially, I'm not going to get super into detail on this, but uh, we'll talk more about it when we get to the diuretics uh, and how that affects um, the kidneys. Uh, but essentially, just know that by having decreased activity of carbonic anhydrase, you can see here, you're going to be having decreased flow of water across this direction, less aqueous humor production. Okay. Okay, some other ones. So again, these is even further down kind of the, the uh, 
treatment algorithm are going to be your cholinergic agonists. We'll talk about why that is in a second. But basically, these are activating our muscarinic receptors. It's going to cause a ciliary muscle uh, contraction, and that actually will help to decrease um, or actually increase the aqueous outflow. So that can be another kind of good mechanism to, to utilize here. The problem is you're going to end up running into um, some decent side effects from this cholinergic agonism. Um, a couple of agents we have here are things like acetylcholine. Uh, again, acetylcholine makes sense because that's you know the thing that normally activates that system anyway. Um, this is going to be more often used in kind of the surgical settings, not really for like an outpatient management. Um, but the two drugs we have here includes carbacol and then pilocarpine. All help to lead to further muscarinic agonism. You see more contraction of that ciliary muscle, leading to increased uh, outflow. The problem though is that we have pretty poor compliance due to side effects because again, if you activate those muscarinic receptors, what does that do to the pupil? Constricts it, right? So what do you think that does to your vision? Makes it worse, right? Because again, you can't really, uh, you're, you're going to have an in decreased ability to really to uh, react to light and to change, you know, uh, change the, that diameter there. Um, so you're going to have fixed small pupils, myopia, uh, visual disturbances. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially if they are, you know, relying on their vision, like, you know, need to need to have the, the, the ability to kind of accommodate for light and, and, and all that. So again, um, younger patients typically are going to be intolerant to this therapy due to the visual blurring. But if it was an older patient, maybe they've already progressed to a point where they have pretty significant visual field loss to begin with. Um, this might be a better option for them. But younger patients, probably not going to be good. And obviously, there's lots of combination products that are available out there. So things like bromonidine and Timbalol. Right, we can do things like brinzolamide, bromonidine. So again, there's lots of combination products, and, and the benefit of this is it helps to increase compliance because now you're just applying one product instead of say like two. Uh, so you may see a, a lot of those that are out there. Um, again, some synergistic effects here. You usually want to combine things that are working kind of on both sides of the equation. There, we're decreasing aqueous humor production and increasing outflow. They're gonna be good. Okay, so who to treat? Typically, uh, patients who have risk factors for glaucoma, you, you're you going to be monitoring them until they actually have glaucoma and changes occurring, so you're doing kind of frequent exams to see how that's changing. Um, I'm sorry, those without risk factors. Those who actually have a risk factor or family history, as soon as you're kind of detecting they have intraocular hypertension, that's typically when you want to start treatment. So again, starting earlier to help prevent those complications from happening in the first place. Um, generally, start with a prostaglandin or a beta blocker depending on you know, the conversation with the patient, comorbid conditions, things like that. And then um, one of the things you can actually do is try therapy just in one eye to determine how eff efficacious it's going to be and if they have any side effects. That can be one thing you try there. And generally, your goal is to try to get, a, say, a 20 to 30% uh, reduction in intraocular pressure. If you're not meeting that, then perhaps adding on a second drug uh, that kind of works on a, a, an opposite mechanism can be useful there. Okay, so any questions on glaucoma? Pretty straightforward. Um, now we're going to look at a few ocular anesthetics. Um, so these are going to be very useful for helping us uh, to do uh, things like fundoscopic exams or if we need to do like a um, fluorescein staining. Um, you'll oftentimes use a lot of these ocular anesthetics for um, usually just in the, on the clinic side or on the inpatient side. Um, these are not going to be things you're going to prescribe to your patients for outpatient use. We'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, but basically the way the anesthetics work is they're going to be blocking sodium influx along the nerves. And so why do you think that would cause anesthesia? Yeah, so it blocks the action potential from traveling back up to the brain. So even though um, the nerve endings may be getting stimulated in the eye, um, that signal is being blocked from propagating up the nerve back into the, the CNS. So that's essentially how all these anesthetics are going to work. So when you talk about lidocaine, uh, even cocaine can do this to some degree. Like they, they can all work by blocking those sodium channels. Um, the primary ones we use for uh, ocular purposes include tetracaine and propericaine. Um, again, indications include things like tonometry, foreign body removal, you know, superficial corneal surgery. These are the most common places you're going to see it being used. And again, not a whole lot of adverse reactions for the most part. Even though they did have a little bit of burning sensation, they probably aren't going to feel very much of it until maybe afterwards. But the problem here is that the eyes will remain numb for about 10 to 20 minutes. So that means no blink reflex. Why is that a problem? Dry eyes, you can see further you know, corneal abrasion, things like that, uh, if they are not blinking appropriately. This is actually kind of interesting. I mentioned cocaine. Uh, it's actually one of the first local anesthetics we ever actually discovered. Uh, and so we used to use it for like a lot of ENT procedures for a long time. I've kind of moved away from that because, um, you know, it's a good vasoconstrictor. Uh, it is a good uh, anesthetizing the area by blocking the sodium channels. Uh, one of the interesting things is that for patients who uh, smoke crack cocaine, one of the problems they have is they get what we call crack eye. And so essentially, when they're smoking crack, uh, again, don't do it, it's very bad for you, um, you end up getting these vapors that will come off of uh, off the pipe and everything, and so that'll end up interacting with the eye. And so that anesthetic, if that happens to the eye, and then their blink reflex is diminished, and so they end up kind of getting really bad um, you know, kind of chronic damage done to the eye just because they're not blinking as they should be, right? Uh, so that's going to be one of the kind of unique side effects of, of uh, crack use. Again, crack is whack, 
just don't do it. Um, and again, I say don't write prescriptions for these. Why do you think that is? Hmm? Not really addiction so much. Um, but if patients are self-medicating with this stuff, and again, um, you know, my eye is really hurting me. I should go ahead and use this uh, anesthetic. Um, they may be kind of uh, treating themselves to a point where they're not going to get further evaluation for something more serious, right? So again, um, and also do the decreased uh, blink reflux and all that. So again, don't recommend these for outpatient use, um, only for, you know, in the clinic, in the, in the ER, wherever you happen to be working. We have some cycloplegic agents. What do you think cycloplegia means? Uh, yes, for dilating the eye, yeah. So essentially it's going to be preventing uh, the eye from constricting, so, or the people from constricting. Um, these are going to be used uh, most often diagnostically for fundoscopic exams, so you can get a really good view back of the retina. Um, for uveitis, uh, potentially, it helps to release some of the ciliary spasm. Uh, but uh, there's two kind of classes of drugs we can use, because we mentioned that typically the sympathetic nervous system does what to the, the pupil? Dilate, right? Think of flight or flight. I need to see everything I can, so I'm going to dilate the eye, right? Uh, versus the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system is going to do constrict, right? So this is where we can either block the parasympathetic nervous system or activate the sympathetic nervous system. Both of those things should lead to dilation of the eye in these cases. So as far as anti-muscarinics go, and that makes sense, by blocking that muscarinic receptor, you're going to see dilation of the eye. Um, basically, you're going to see, uh, uh, this, this is my driasis here, um, you have things like atropine is a very common one you see being used. Um, cyclopentylate or cyclogel. And then tropicamide. Those are kind of the most common um, cycloplegics that we use that are anti-muscarinic, essentially. Um, now, obviously, the, the adverse effects here, you can see some photosensitivity. Why do you think that is? Yeah, your pupils are wide open, right? You're going to be letting all that light in, so it can be very photosensitive and also have some blurred vision here. So again, that can affect your ability to accommodate. Typically, what you see is that the anti-muscarinics tend to um, mess up with your vision for longer than the sympathetic agents we're going to look at in a second. Um, and so this is why, you know, you need to have someone come drive you after you get your eyes dilated with these kind of anti-muscarinics because it, it, you're not really able to accommodate to light very well. You can't really accommodate the lens, um, so you're going to have that blurry vision, right? It's really hard to see well. <laughs> On the other side, we have the sympathomimetics. Typically, you have uh, a better retention of the ability to, to react to light in a lot of cases. Um, and so, again, you're still going to have this mydriasis, but it won't be as really profound as you will see with the anti-muscarinics. Um, but this is going to uh, include phenylephrine. And I kind of mentioned phenylephrine before, right? I kind of mentioned it's kind of a wimpy cousin to pseudoephedrine uh, when you take it orally for, you know, cough and cold kind of uh, purposes. But phenylephrine can be a very good one when applied kind of directly to the eye to lead to mydriasis. Okay, and then fluorescein, a uh, very common um, uh, medication used to help with uh, eye examination, especially if you're looking for things like corneal abrasions and whatnot. Um, this is basically going to be uh, staining the eyes so that way you can use a woods lamp, uh, get that black light out and be able to shine on there. You can kind of see what some of these will, will look like. Uh, I have one doctor who uh, cannot spell fluorescein to save his life. So every time I was in the ER and you do an eye exam, he's like, Adam, how do you spell fluorescein? It's like F-L-U-O-R, and then you, know, you eventually find it in the system. But regardless, um, just know that U comes before the O, and then U should be fine. Um, anywho, so uh, you know, not a lot of issues with this drug. You may see a little bit of burning, hypersensitivity, um, but uh, the big thing is that you typically use an anesthetic on the eye before you use this. And again, just kind of basically just dipping it directly on, onto the eye itself, and that, that will stain will kind of go across. Um, you can, you know, where else you can find fluorescein? Uh, maybe associated with your car. Radiator, Radiator fluid. Why do we put it there? Yeah, it's absolutely it. So you can see leaks. Um, so, you know, your, your mechanic can take a black light basically and look for leaks in the radiator by using, um, uh, by utilizing the fluorescein that's in the uh, radiator fluid. That's actually another thing. If you've ever had someone who drank a bunch of radiator fluid, um, you can actually fluoresce the urine to see um, uh, see if it's uh, anything is still there or not. You know, so that's one. If you ever see someone use a black lamp on, or black light on, um, uh, on a bag of urine, that's typically what they're, they're looking for to see that fluorescein uh, from antifreeze ingestion. So a little common factoid. Anywho, so yeah, so you can use these for eye exams. Um, pretty, pretty common use in, in urgent cares and, and ERs. Uh, kind of another interesting one, this is called tripan blue or vision blue. It's actually uh, something they'll use in more uh, ophthalmic surgeries where they can um, help to uh, collect this in, in the actual lens of the eye and will help to, uh, with like vivitrectomy, or vitrectomy, I should say, um, guiding excision. So kind of interesting staining that will kind of be there for, for a while. Okay. So again, education points, uh, make sure, we kind of talked about a lot of these already. Um, other things to note uh, is that you don't want to touch the eyes 
with the dropper, right? You want to keep that sterile as long as you can. And typically, if you're applying different medications, um, you want to wait about five minutes or so between drugs. That can be another good point because uh, if you use it too soon, one can wash away the other and you may not get the full effect there. This is more important for like your glaucoma patients who are on multiple meds uh, at a time. This can help to, to make them be a little bit more effective. So any questions on the ophthalmic section? Yes. Um, so visines wouldn't mean antihistamine, just to, because it should be a vasoconstrictor, right? So, yeah, so um, they could use that for just injection hyperemia, uh, for sure. So I guess, like, the classic thing is, like, you know, smoking a doobie, and then you need to deal with your red eyes. Like, that could be something that, you know, probably the, the number one consumer of visine, I would say, for the over-the-counter use. Um, but, Um, you know, it's one of those things where you don't want to use it too chronically because you end up seeing that rebound hyperemia that can occur there. So it's kind of like they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. So they can deal with kind of the baseline problem. If it's an allergic issue, using the antihistamine can be fine for that. Um, but, you know, using an actual vasoconstrictor more chronically is probably not recommended. To answer the question? Uh, a little bit. A little bit? Okay. You can talk about it later if you, if you like. Any other question? Okay. I'm going to move into the pulmonology section just because we have a lot to cover. So sorry if you were expecting to leave early. All right, so um, this is going to kind of bleed off of the stuff we we're talking about in the ENT section. So we're going to talk a little bit about pulmonary antitussives and also expectorants. So antitussive being what? Stop your, uh, stop your coughing. And then expectorant. Yeah, try to get rid of mucus, try to get rid of all that uh, gunky stuff in the lungs. Um, it's always kind of interesting how, like, you, know, you see a lot of over-the-counter products that will include an antitussive and an expectorant. It's kind of like, why do you do the combination? Like, if you're trying to cough up the mucus, but then you're trying to inhibit your cough. Like, it doesn't really make a ton of sense, but that's one of the things you'll see pretty cool. Anywho, um, yeah, you know, we have cough receptors uh, located all the way through the respiratory tract. They respond to things like chemical, mechanical irritants. Um, we see this is one of the primary sites for some of our antitussives are actually going to be, be working here. Um, but basically, we know once we have an activation of kind of this cough reflex, you're going to see a pretty coordinated um, you know, inspiration followed by a lot of contraction of a lot of the uh, you know, abdominal wall muscles, uh, glottis closure, chest wall, diaphragm, all that's going to be squeezed together in order to you know, expectorate out whatever happened to be uh, causing the cough in the first place, hopefully. right? And in very high pressures, very high speeds, 500 miles an hour, I saw, I was like, that's, that's pretty fast, but I don't, I don't know if I ever actually verified that, but it's, it's pretty quick. I mean, I assume it's on the internet, so it must be correct, right? Yeah. Anyway, so the problems with cough. Why do we uh, worry about cough? Anyone ever, like, lived with someone who has, like, chronic cough? Like, chronic dry cough? Hmm? Yeah. Isn't that, like, terrible? <laughs> oh, this guy right here? Yeah. Yeah, so, again, it's just, it's just uh, it's bad for the patient, bad for everyone else around them. It can be uh, very, very uh, bad on quality of life in a lot of cases. But um, issues you can see with chronic cough, you can see insomnia, exhaustion, you know, just musculoskeletal pain from coughing constantly, hoarseness. And then less commonly, you can even see some patients may be predisposed to dysrhythmias due to this, syncope, rib fracture, all kinds of really kind of r random rare things you can see with this chronic cough. Obviously, our uh, goal here is to reduce that number and severity of coughing episodes and hopefully prevent any of these complications from occurring. So first drug we can use uh, is called benzonatate or Tessalon. You may see it called like Tessalon pearls. Uh, and so this is a very common antitussive that we'll be uh, prescribing. Uh, again, this would be uh, prescription only. We'll have some other agents that are going to be uh, over the counter. Um, but basically, this drug works by actually anesthetizing uh, the stress receptors in the lungs. And so uh, it kind of works similar to the other anesthetics we we're just talking about by kind of blocking that signal propagation of the, the neuron. Um, so if you never get that, the brain never gets that signal that, hey, we should cough, then it's, you're not going to initiate a cough here. So typically these drugs are used kind of at as needed basis. So again, if you're having a coughing episode, you can take this and hopefully prevent that from occurring. Um, again, it's usually for more non-productive costs. So again, if you're coughing because you have a cold and you're you're trying to get rid of all this kind of nasty mucus, like that's probably okay. Like you probably want that's a it's a good mechanism there. But it's just kind of a chronic non-productive cough. Like you just you know need to treat that. Um, Anything to note here is that, you know, there's certain drugs you don't want to, like, crush, chew, or swallow, or uh, crush, chew, or crush, or anything like that. Um, or anything, what's it? Cut, I should say. Uh, this is going to be one of those ones you really don't want to cut or bite into because you can actually see local anesthetic effects actually on the tongue. Uh, this is one of the problems. Like, if you try to give it to kids or something, they can actually chew on it and end up getting uh, their tongue is numb all of a sudden. So you don't want to do that. Uh, so really just kind of take it as, as it comes. Um, this probably goes down as one of the most difficult medications. Now, I know... Um, you know, the, the pharmacist you probably had in your mind before coming into school was the guy behind the counter uh, that can count to 30 and fives, you know, with a little butter knife. 
these pills go down as the number one hardest thing to get into a bottle ever because they roll uh, like crazy. So like, you know, I just kind of pour just a few out into the little tray and then I'll find them over on the floor, you know, like a month later. Um, so these are the bane of my existence, the few times I do retail. Anywho, um, just note that that, that kind of indicate or that uh, reaction there you can see. So again, this is why kids usually don't get uh, prescribed this very often because they end up kind of trying to chew on it. It looks like candy as well. So they try to get into it and so it's no good. The other thing we have that is more commonly used, and this is an over-the-counter uh, product here, uh, is called dextromethorphan, otherwise known as Robitussin or Delsum. Uh, anyone know why I put a picture of Bender the robot here? What do you call it when you do a whole lot of uh, Robitussin? Okay, so I know who went to the good parties. Uh, I, I did this to my, uh, my Adventist students, and, and none of them knew it. And I said, like, well, I guess you guys are the good Christian kids, so it uh, makes sense. But... Um, yeah, so robo-tripping is, is what that's called when you have uh, basically uh, someone trying to abuse this medication. We'll talk about why, why you can do that in just a few minutes here. But if you ever hear robo-tripping, that's what they're referring to, is using a whole lot of uh, robitussin or, or dexamethorphan. So basically what we see here is this drug is actually related structurally to codeine. Remember, codeine is what type of drug? Something like morphine and heroin. It's an opiate, yeah, absolutely. So this is actually structurally related to an opiate. And one of the things you'll learn uh, when we get to talking about opioids is they actually have very good anti tussive effects themselves. So you can take something like a Tylenol number three, which has Tylenol and codeine in it. Um, they have a product called Tussine X, which is liquid hydrocodone. And all of those can actually work as anti tussives um, just due to their natural opioid effects. Um, the benefit here with Robitussin is it actually does not give you any of those kind of uh, analgesic effects or any kind of those euphoric effects. It specifically just works on those, on those cough centers uh, to prevent uh, uh, further coughing from occurring there. And so uh, basically, you know, it's going to be suppressing that medullary cough center. Uh, and so again, it's not working directly on those stretch receptors in the lungs, it's working kind of more centrally uh, to do that. So obviously our indication would be cough. Um, some side effects you can see, some people react very strangely to, to dextromethorphan due to the fact that it also has some effects on uh, NMDA receptors. You guys remember talking about NMDA receptors? Remember what activates an NMDA receptor? What neurotransmitter? So glutamate is going to be uh, a big one there, right? So remember, I think GABA is being kind of a really inhibitory neurotransmitter, glutamate being more excitatory. Um, glutamate can interact with NMDA receptors, and this is actually the same receptor that we block when we give ketamine. By blocking this NMDA receptor, you get kind of this dissociative anesthetic effect. This is what people usually are trying to abuse with dextromethorphan. They take really big doses of it, and they'll describe it as kind of being like an out-of-body experience. You know, like, you know, they, they can see themselves... Uh, and you know, they kind of go on these crazy trips, um, but th this is what they're kind of going for. And so some people can get this even at therapeutic doses, so you can see some confusion, agitation. I'll never forget one of our overnight pharmacists had, had come in uh, to work for the evening, and she had really bad coughs, so she took dextromethorphan. She's a very tiny um, uh, kind of person, and she uh, took a regular adult dose of it and did not realize how it was going to affect her. She's like, yeah, I was driving in, and like, everyone's going so slow. And I was just like, oh gosh, can you work tonight? Like, she's like, no, I think I'm okay, but man. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen um, uh, Black Sheep and, and Chris Farley gets pulled over and they're like, you know how fast you're going? Four. You're going four miles an hour. Um, kind, of, kind of similar kind of thing. <laughs> Anywho, um, go watch that movie. It's pretty good. Um, other risk you can see with dextromethorphan is you worry about having kind of risk of serotonin uh, kind of side effects. So if you have someone who's on medications that affect serotonin, so think about like your SSRIs that we use a lot for depression, um, or even older drugs that block monoamine oxidase. Um, and again, we'll talk more about this in behavioral health. Just know that you can see potential risk for serotonergic toxicity, right? Um, just to kind of note that this is a feature of this drug. We'll talk more about that in, in depth when we get to the behavioral health section, um, but just kind of keep it in the back of your mind for now. Okay. Uh, we also talked about guafenicin already. Mucinex, again, pretty good ex uh, expector and just had them. Uh, what was the recommendation as far as hydration goes? Yeah. Lots of water, right? Because you want to help to loosen that stuff up so that way you can expectorate it out. Okay. So I won't kind of too much. All right. So moving on, getting into pulmonary antibiotics. Anyone antibiotic out already? <laughs> going to continue on. First off, let's talk about bronchitis. Again, this is going to be an inflammation, obviously, of the, uh, the bronchi, usually secondary to uh, infection. Um, notice it's not going to be as deep as you see with like a pneumonia, typically not involving the bronchioles or the alveoli here. Um, obviously, acute bronchitis can affect people of all ages, um, but we'll talk about chronic uh, bronchitis as being more of a feature of a lot of like your COPD patients. And we'll talk about that more uh, in the next pulmonary section uh, during this class. 
So um, again, more common during the winter months. Uh, usually begins as kind of an upper respiratory tract infection and kind of spread down to being more kind of a bronchitis. And then uh, typically, you see coughs pretty early, being non-productive, uh, productive, then eventually becoming much more mucopurulent as time goes on. They may not have fever, you know, may or may not have uh, bronchi or coarse bilateral uh, rails, you know, things like that. And then typically on the x-ray, you wouldn't see really any alveolar involvement, right? So it's kind of typically how it would present. So common causes, most commonly, going to be viruses, right? So this is one of the big reasons why a lot of people get uh, over-prescribing of antibiotics because they get bronchitis, they come in, they want an antibiotic, right? They want a Z-pack usually. Um, but we'll realize we don't want to do that in most cases. Occasionally, when it is bacterial, this is where you're going to see risk for certain types of bugs like mycoplasma, pneumonia, chlamydia, pneumonia. What, do you, what kind of bugs are these? Those are atypicals, right? So this is important because now we're looking at what type of bugs we need to treat based on the site of infection. Now we're thinking atypicals. And then we also have our usual kind of ilk of uh, gram positive and negative. So things like strep uh, pneumo, uh, staphylococcus species occasionally, and then homophilus uh, as well. Again, most of these end up occurring kind of secondary to uh, a viral infection. Kind of the bacteria use is as an opportunity to kind of settle in once the virus is kind of already hit. So as treatment goes, typically it's going to be pretty self-limited. So you mainly want to just provide kind of good supportive care for them. You know, analgesics, antipyretics, you know, uh, what could we use as an antipyretic? Yeah, Tylenol, ibuprofen. Yeah, so typical like kind of over-the-counter stuff. So you, those would be simple recommendations. Um, again, you typically want to avoid uh, or possibly avoid antihistamines and sympathomimetics. So things like Sudafed, these are antihistamines. Now, the reason for that is because when you have antihistamines, they typically uh, tend to be drying. And also the same thing with the sympathomimetic, they tend to dry out as well. Um, you can dry those bronchial secretions and make them less likely to um, be expectorated. And so we kind of want to prevent that. And, and you want to kind of get rid of that, all that mucopurulent sputum and whatnot. So that way you can you know, clear the infection, hopefully a little bit, a little bit easier. Now, again, routine antibiotics are not going to be recommended in most cases. Again, this is a common cause for those unnecessary prescriptions. Uh, but if they have, you know, some things you may be that lead you to think more bacterial involvement could be like, you know, if they have really persistent symptoms, you know, greater than five days or so, this is when you can start to consider, well, maybe it is a bacteria. Maybe it's not just viral. Uh, in these cases, you want obviously something that's going to be able to hit kind of those typical upper respiratory tract bugs. Also, though, you want to get your um, atypicals as well. So uh, this is where something like doxycycline uh, can be utilized. Again, who do you not want to use doxycycline in? Pregnant, Pregnant women and Children. kids less than eight. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, this would be good because uh, doxycycline uh, kind of retains good activity against mycoplasma um, because, again, we overprescribe things like uh, Z-packs and, and macrolides. So um, doxy can be can be preferred here in a lot of cases. Um, as far as macrolides go, obviously, azithromycin is probably the, the go-to. In a lot of cases, I don't see a ton of erythromycin being prescribed for this, but clorithromycin or biaxin uh, could also be used. And occasionally, um, you know, we, we can utilize a respiratory fluoroquinolone, so something like a levofloxacin or something like that. Um, but, and we'll talk more about what those respiratory fluoroquinolones are when we get to like pneumonias. Uh, but essentially, you want to uh, avoid these because, again, resistance is such a big problem with these guys um, that uh, unless they've had kind of a recent antibiotic exposure, you probably don't need to, to utilize these. And why, do I, why do I give that caveat of like recent antibiotic exposure? Because they're more likely to be having resistant bugs, right? So again, if they've had uh, you know previous courses of bronchitis, they've already had a Z pack, you know, three times in the last three months. Um, this could be a thing where you're more worried about resistant bugs. Using a fluoroquinolone may be a good option in those, those cases, right? So something like uh, azithromycin, you have resistance from mycoplasma. Um, using a fluoroquinolone is going to be able to overcome that in most cases, right? Because again, are we usually culturing these type of patients? Not commonly, no. So you really wouldn't do that in a lot of cases unless you had some other compelling indication to do so. Okay, uh, I think I'm actually going to cut it here. It's about time, right? You guys have any questions? That's six minutes. I'll, I'll cut it. Uh, any questions I can answer for you guys? All right. Yes, ma'am. What was um, the receptor? Was it NDA? NMDA. N -N it's like Nancy, Matt, dog, Apple. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't have a stroke just then. <laughs> yes. In that previous slide, um, you said that when you think macrolide resistance, uh, usually mycoplasma is one of the things that uh, becomes resistant. So that's when something like, you know, uh, fluoroquinolone could be a good option. So would you do a culture to figure out what it is exactly? No, not typically. It would be like one of those cases where a patient is coming back for frequent bronchitis, like they've received multiple courses of antibiotics, and like, you know, you're still thinking bacterial, um, but if they are, you know, 
it's been that many times they've received kind of the same medication every time, you may be thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll switch over to do something else in those cases. Um, but yeah, I typically don't see a lot of cultures being done for, for things like this. So would you always try to use the Levo because it works really well? Uh, we're not really worried about pseudomonas for, for bronchitis specifically, um, but you know, you're going to see there are certain uh, fluoroquinolones that will have um, better or worse penetration into the lungs. We'll talk more about that in the pneumonia section, uh, but Levoquin is a, a decent one you can use as a respiratory fluoroquinolone. For the most part, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I will uh, talk to you guys uh, next time then. Thanks.